As Kirsten says, we're looking at about a half an hour to address a very broad topic area. It's actually, I consider it basically three areas. And uh, we're going to cover very briefly personal digital security, website security, and legal issues. Now, my goal, I think, for 30 minutes can't be to necessarily make you an expert across all three areas. It's not reasonable to think of that. So my goal is the, for these topics isn't really to demonstrate either that I'm an expert or to make you an expert. But what I really hope to do is to make you think about the issues and provide a few practical starting points for you to improve your individual situation. Because if you can walk out here and you're better, then I think I, I've done my job. And if you're starting to think about the issues and be aware of some of these issues, uh, I'll be really happy and feel like I've done a good job with 30 minutes of time. We have a really broad audience as far as technical expertise that sits in this room. So uh, I'm going to try and do something that'll be interesting to just about everybody, but I don't know. Hopefully it won't be too hard for, uh, for anyone to follow. I, I'm going to try and make it really practical. Uh, and maybe, maybe if you listen, you'll pay and f you'll find just one or two helpful things, and I'll, and I'll be happy if that happens. First up, we are going to talk about personal digital security. When we think about personal individual security, we think about those uh-oh moments in our life. How many of you have had an uh-oh moment when it comes to the little gizmos that you carry around? Anybody had an uh-oh? Yeah, I think, I think many of us have had an uh-oh. Here's my uh-oh. Here we have a rather upscale eating establishment that we like to frequent in the U.S., some of us. Uh, this is this is really up there on the list for my kids. They, this one, yeah, pretty, I mean, it's either this or, I, I don't know. The reason they like it, of course, is because the food comes quick. And food coming quick is, a, is of real importance when you're five years old. You don't want to sit there and wait for the food. You want the food, and you want it now. OK, anyway, my five-year-old was sick. And I was staying home with him, and he's starting to feel a little bit better. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to cheer him up. We're going to go to Taco Bell, and we're going to get some food. Well, it didn't work, because when we got in the Taco Bell, the boy starts feeling sick. And not the throwing up kind of sick, thankfully, just the fever kind of sick. But he wasn't feeling good. So I hurried, and we left, and we walked out, and got to the car, and uh-oh, where's my phone? My phone was still in the Taco Bell. Maybe you lost your phone like me. Maybe you have poured something on your laptop. Anybody eat with their laptop right there? I know, you know, if I'm working, I do, right? You know, got something to drink, you're comfortable, pour something in there. Of course, every one of us, right, we're human, we have a pride problem, and this stuff doesn't, this stuff's not gonna happen today, and it's not gonna happen to me. It's gonna be all right today for me. I don't break stuff, I'm careful these things don't happen. Um, if it's never happened to you and you have that kind of, a, kind of a pride problem, you know, I'm really careful this never happens, uh, guess what, your turn's next. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about data security, we have to consider two things. We have to consider minimizing the loss, which we're gonna talk about backups real briefly, and we have to think about minimizing the damage and when we talk about that, we're talking about security. And the reason why we have to talk about these things together is this. A lot of the stuff that you'll do to make your digital life more secure makes it a lot harder for those guys or those women that support your computer to bring your data back if you somehow forget your password, if you damage something. The data recovery, if you're being more secure, is a much grimmer situation, so you need to think about backups. Backups are a really boring topic, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Okay, you have some options for backups, right? You can ask the IT department to do it. Yeah, they got this magical box sitting downstairs somewhere, and they put this little software on your computer, and it backs up. Do you know if your IT department backs up your computer? Yeah, you think they do, right? 
Um, do you know what they back up on your computer? You might want to think about that. Not all IT departments back up everything. Sometimes they back up only the documents, and all of those pictures you put on there of your kids, then that's the only place you got them. Well, they don't care about those. That's not a business need to have those back. That's just you, okay? So if your IT department backs up your computer, do they back up everything? Do you know if it works? Have you ever tried to get something back out of the IT department's backup? Let me tell you something, not all IT departments are perfect. There are times when you lose the computer and you go down and you try and get the backup and they say, oh, well, the last backup we had was two years ago. <laughs> Great, <laughs> I got all my stuff up till two years ago. So do you know if it works? You can do it yourself. Some of you don't have an IT department. You can get an external hard drive. Uh, you can plug it in. And Macs and Windows both have backup software that you can use. And when we think about backups, you got to set it up, right? You test it. You see if that backup is working and doing what you think it's supposed to be doing. And then every once in a while, it might be a really good idea to test it again. See if you can get a recent picture out of that backup. Because the last thing you want to do is be looking at your backups and say, yes, I get everything up till two years ago. <laughs> there are other options for backups. Uh, one I really like is called backblaze.com. You have to pay for it, and it backs your stuff up to the cloud. So even the thing about that hard drive, right, that you get for your computer, um, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but uh, what if you lose that drive too? Often that drive sits right next to the computer, and when you have something happen to your house like happened to my house, um, you wonder if they're going to get the drive too. So if they get the drive and the computer, where will you be? Thankfully, when this happened at my house, uh, they didn't take anything. It was just, we don't know who did it. We think somebody did it for kicks. Um, they were sitting upstairs eating one Sabbath evening, and we hear a loud pop. And we go downstairs, and 12 feet into our basement room, there's this brick on the floor. And, uh, but if we hadn't been home, you know, my, I have a computer that sits down there. You know, if my backup's sitting on the drive right next to the computer. So that's one reason to consider uh, something like a cloud backup, like backblaze.com. It slowly backs all your data up onto there. The other reason I like backblaze.com is you can actually put in a code so that it encrypts the backups on the way up, and even the Backblaze people can't get it back. For some things, you can even use Dropbox if you're, if you're wanting to. Uh, I worry a little bit about security and what you put into something like a Dropbox. But uh, Dropbox, it's another cloud storage thing. You can put your files in there. And uh, it actually has history. Many of you who, who use Dropbox don't know this, but it keeps a history of all the files. So you can roll them back to a previous version if you want to. Uh, or if you even delete them out of the Dropbox, sometimes you can get them back even then. Um, now we're going to move on to security and the things that we carry. We carry lots of stuff, don't we? We carry laptops. We carry these little thumb drives. Some of us carry iPhones. Some of us carry Android. Some of us carry iPads. We carry all sorts of different things. And we'll talk briefly about security. Uh, across these different things. Um, first of all, the laptop. Okay, we have a laptop here. It's a beautiful laptop. It's a Mac. That means it works well. Um, all the time, every time, right? <laughs> anyway. Um, when we're securing our computers, uh, what do we do to secure our computers? You put a password on it, right? Okay. If you have a computer and you've got a password on it, is a password enough? Is a password enough? How many think a password's enough? Raise your hand. Are you brave? Password enough? The password at the login's enough. Well, that's kind of a trick question. The password at the login can be enough if the password also unlocks your encrypted drive. The fact of the matter is that many computers, uh, well, pretty much every computer has a drive sitting inside, right? And if you have not gone to the trouble of making sure your drive is encrypted and somebody steals your laptop, the first thing they do is they unscrew between 
four and 10 screws on the bottom of your laptop, they pull out the drive, and they plug it into a little device that turns it into an external USB drive, right? And they can get all your stuff off of there. And they can do that if you have not encrypted the drive. So we want to encrypt our drives on our laptops. It's very important. However, if you don't have good backups, it's risky because when you encrypt that drive, all of the traditional data recovery methods are not going to work real well. So make sure you have backups before you do it. We want a screen saver that locks the screen. If you leave your laptop alone for a little while, uh, something should come on there, and it should not be that somebody can just walk up and use it. Okay, we've got the encrypted hard drive, we've got the lock screen, we've got the lock path, we've got the lock that comes on when it, the password that comes on when it uh, starts up. Uh, what else? We've got other things that we can do to make this laptop better. What else? Anybody gonna help me? Brian, thank you. Brian's going to help. What else can we do to make this laptop better? Oh, yeah, random USB sticks. That's been a big topic lately. Uh, why wouldn't we want to plug random USB sticks into it? That's a good answer. External USB drive, USB is actually kind of dangerous and we're learning that more in the last year because the computer basically trusts whatever USB thing you plug in. The USB thing that you can plug in can act like a keyboard, can act like a, a drive, and the computer just basically trusts it. Um, anybody think we need antivirus software on here? Yes, we like antivirus software. Okay, what about installing software from, I don't know, all our favorite websites? You know, what, what kind of software do we put on there? What kind, of, what kind of sites do we get our software from? What? Nobody, no, nobody gets it from BitTorrent, right? No? Pirate, pirate, the CNET? Pirate Bay? No. no. Pirate Bay, no. Nobody's getting it from Pirate Bay. You get software some, from some of these shady places. Um, yeah, that's not a good plan if you want to keep your laptop secure. That's one reason, not the only reason. You shouldn't be getting it from there, but uh, one reason. The other reason is maybe you're not paying for the software, and that's maybe not a security issue, but an ethical issue. Okay. Oh, we're going to do iPhone and Android. Yes. Okay. Uh, who thinks iPhone's better? A iPhone? iPhone's better? Android's better? Uh, oh. We're going to start a war? <laughs> okay. Actually, I did a little bit of research. I personally, I run around with an iPhone. Okay. Um, I did a little research on that topic, and uh, I'm actually I'm not an Android hater, really. Um, what I what I learned when I looked about the issue, because the iPhone people will be telling lots of Android people the iPhone's more secure. Have you ever heard that? iPhone people telling Android people iPhone's more secure, so let's everybody use the iPhone. What I learned when I dug a little bit deeper into that issue is one of the big problems with Android is that people like to sideload the applications. What sideloading an application means is you're getting it from somewhere other than the Play Store, right? Nobody would ever get an Android application off Pirate Bay, right? No, okay, or some website, just a random website. You know, you don't want to pay for it on the Play Store, so you decide you're going to download it from the website. Well, it turns out that the security issues with Android are often very much related to the sources that people are getting their software from. So even while the application may work when you get it from some shady place, um, it may come with a bonus feature that you are unaware of. So uh, I recommend Android people um, get your applications from legitimate sources and uh, be careful about that. The USB sticks, um, we still use USB sticks. I see them handed out at conferences. How can we secure a USB stick? Do we have anybody running around with USB sticks? Yes? Yeah, you got USB sticks? What kind of stuff do you put on that USB stick? It's a little tiny thing. What kind of things do you put on that USB stick? PowerPoints, yes, great. Oh, everything, okay. Do you put your customer list with all their uh, government IDs on the unencrypted USB stick? and? It, pictures. pictures, okay. 
That's handy, right? USB sticks are real handy. I recommend for this USB sticks, don't put stuff on there that you'd mind if it were to get loose. And if you are gonna put stuff on there that you would mind if it were to get lost, uh, you can encrypt that USB stick. If you don't know how to encrypt your USB stick, you have no business putting anything on there that you wouldn't mind the whole world seeing. <laughs> because <laughs> who's lost a USB stick? Has anybody ever lost one of those? Yes. Yeah. Who's found one? Who's <laughs> oh, who's found one? <laughs> You know what? I heard an interesting security about that and we're, story about that, and we're going to sidetrack here. Who's, th there, was a, there was a company that was commissioned to do a study of security at a bank. Did you hear? Has anybody, any of the IT guys in the, here heard this story? A company was, was said, was, was an external company, a bank wanted to know how secure their bank was. And so they called in this company and they said, try and hack our bank. So you know what this company that was going to hack the bank did? They scattered a bunch of USB sticks in the parking lot. <laughs> and those USB sticks had things on them. And so what happened in the morning? The, the, work, the bank workers came in, right? Free USB sticks. We all love free. <laughs> yeah, it's like roadkill. Free USB sticks, you know? Anybody take roadkill home and eat it? Well, these bank employees essentially did that. They grabbed these USB sticks out the parking lot, they didn't take them home, they took them into the bank, they jacked them into the computer, and those USB sticks had interesting things on them, and when they plugged them into the computer, they opened them up and they said, oh, well, the icon looks like a picture. It wasn't a picture, it was a program, and before long, the bank was riddled with uh, holes that this company was commissioned to make to hack the bank, and the bank was hacked. So, uh, yeah, free USB sticks may have a bonus on them. Um, so yeah, lots of doodads that we carry. Uh, one of the big ways that we can secure these doodads when we travel is to not travel with them at all. You know, maybe you want to just travel with uh, one or two, or maybe one. I don't know. Um, I have to travel with a lot of them. Passwords. Yeah, we should talk about passwords. How many of you... Oh no, we're not going to do a show of hands. This is going to be... This is going to be like when you have the silent prayer request. <laughs> All right. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you use the same password for your email, for your computer, for your Facebook, for the login to Farmville, for the login to... <laughs> is Farmville still a thing? I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's still a thing? Okay. Um, How many use the same password across everything? Yeah? How many, how many of you use the same pass? Okay, for extra credit, you can use the same password for everything, and that password can be one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> okay. In all seriousness, um, number one thing about passwords is, well, there's a lot of number, okay, number one thing, number one, is not one, two, three, four, five, six people. Everybody knows when they're trying to hack somebody that the first thing you try is one, two, three, four, five, six. What's the second one? Who knows what's the second one? That you... What? Password. There we go. Password. <laughs> who, uses, who uses the word password for your password? It's easy to remember that. It's pretty long. What? Oh, you use that plus something? That's better. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about passwords, um, number one thing is you need a different password for your email than for anything else. Because, okay, say you lose, say you forget what your Twitter password is, Brian. How am I going to get my Twitter password back? Through a long and painful process, which does require your email. Which does require your email. Hopefully you have two-factor turned on, so it requires more than your email to get in. But uh, many web services, uh, the way you get your password back is through your email. Okay. Many web services actually, and we will talk about this, are very sloppy about the way they store the passwords in the database. Okay? So while your email provider like Gmail may do a very good job technically of storing the password, some random web service may do a really bad job of storing the password in the database. And guess what people, the, the kinds of services that do a really bad job of storing the password in the database also do a really bad job of security 
across the board. So when that service inevitably gets hacked, okay, number one, they already have your email address. It's in there as part of your profile. Number two, they didn't do a good job of the passwords in the database, so they have the password that you use, not for your email account, but for that service, right? A hacker, a smart hacker, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to dump the database out and they're going to look and they're going to say, okay, we got all these email addresses and we got all these passwords. Which of these people were foolish enough to use their same password on their email account that they used on this dumb little web service? And you don't want to be one of those foolish people. Okay, we will talk about making better haystacks, uh, better passwords, yeah, making better haystacks. Okay. Here's a haystack. Anybody seen a haystack? They have those over here, right? You, you feed cows in this land, cows and sheep and all sorts of farm. Yeah, OK. When we talk about making better passwords, it's like when a hacker is trying to find a password, let's assume that the, the password was stored pretty well in the database. They're going to try and crack that, right? OK, so it's like finding a needle in the haystack. And what you can do is you can make the haystack bigger. And there's a tool you can use to help you to help you make that haystack bigger. When we talk about making the haystack bigger, we talk about using more than just lowercase letters in your password. You want to include lots of different kinds of characters in your password. You want to use uppercase, you want to use lowercase, you want to use numbers, you want to use symbols. And then you also want to make that password longer. You can pad the password out with things like periods. You can put a bunch of periods in the middle. You can put periods at the, at the beginning. You can put periods at the end. You can put zeros in the middle. Make the password longer. Make it something that you can remember. And uh, you know, make, it, make it hard. Because this is a really cool tool. I'm not going to take the time to actually demonstrate it. But uh, it will show you on screen a little bit of an analysis about the password you're, you're playing with. And it can tell you, uh, at least provide a guess. I don't know how accurate of a guess. But it can, it can give you a little bit of a, a demonstration about uh, how making a password longer and using more kinds of characters can make it a lot harder to, to crack. OK. We are human. We cannot remember all of our passwords, right? One tool that some people like to use is a password manager software. Uh, this one happens to be free, um, that you have one master password, which we hope has a good password on it, right? And then you store lots of passwords in it. This one would live on your computer, and you can use it so that you can have a unique, a unique password for each of the services that you may use. Uh, here's a paid one, which I also like, uh, that will sync it. Antivirus software, we talked about antivirus software briefly. Uh, for home use, for free, Microsoft does have antivirus software. It doesn't necessarily come installed on computers, but you can get it for free. Um, Avast also is uh, offering for free, for home, for home use at least, uh, antivirus software. And they have a Mac version as well as a, as a Windows password. We talked about encryption. Uh, Windows, depending on the Windows thing that you have, may be built into the system. Uh, some Windows things, it's not built in. I wish they built it into everything, and I think I wouldn't be surprised to see Microsoft start. Actually, they have. On newer versions of Windows and for newer devices, Microsoft is building in the encryption. Uh, it, it may not be turned on. I think in some cases, Microsoft is turning it on by default. But uh, you can Google your version of Windows and see whether or not you can turn it on. All the Macs have uh, encryption available on them. It's called BitLocker. You can find it in your security preferences pane. And you, no, it's called, for Mac, it's called File Vault. Uh, for Mac, you can turn it on in your preferences and so that your, uh, your uh, password is secure, uh, your drive is secure. Who likes free Wi-Fi? <laughs> OK. Um, I was going to do a demonstration for free Wi-Fi, but I see my time trickling away. So I'm not going to do the demonstration uh, of free Wi-Fi. Um, here's the basic problem. OK, here's my beautiful Mac laptop looking at my wonderful Facebook page. And it's connect getting the Facebook page over the internet, right? OK, and maybe it's doing this over free Wi-Fi. The problem with free Wi-Fi is you never necessarily know where that traffic is routing through. OK? It could be like this, where you're connected over a very clean network, and you're going right into Facebook, and that's fine. Uh, or it could be something like this. 
Um, maybe the free Wi-Fi. Uh, if you see, if you open up your device right now for my demo, it's going to do this. And so you can see a network called free Wi-Fi. Um, <coughs> actually, you can, if you go through the free Wi-Fi network, it routes through my laptop. And uh, I'm not actually sniffing anybody's traffic, so you're, you're, you're good. But uh, you're good. But, uh, you know, I, I have actually two uh, Wi-Fi networks in my laptop right now. I have this one down here that's connected to the real Wi-Fi, and then my Mac is making another Wi-Fi network, and you're all free to use it. Um, but uh, yeah, watch out when you're, when you're in places uh, and connected to Wi-Fi. Um, the truth of the matter is that in most places when you're connected to a Wi-Fi or to a network in the hotel or something like that, uh, the networks are not very good, and even if it is the official one, Hackers can trick the network into routing traffic through their laptop from the real site. So it goes from the real site to their laptop and then through uh, to your net laptop. So the symptom isn't that the internet doesn't work. The internet may be working just fine, but there is something in the middle that is doing something that you wish it were not. Here's my demo. We're not going to do it. Uh, one one way, it's not, always, it's not always perfect evidence that something's going wrong, but it's a huge red flag. If you are on a Wi-Fi or a network that you do not trust, and you are connecting to a secure site like Facebook or like, uh, or like uh, Gmail or something like that, and your web browser pops up this warning about certificates, this is a huge red flag. Don't ignore the certificate and keep on going and think all is well with the world. Because the fact of the matter is, you will be able to log into the site. And you will think everything is great and life is wonderful because now you're getting your email. But what the person in the middle has done is they have routed the traffic through their laptop and they have stripped off the encryption and then they put their own encryption back on. But right here in the middle, they are able to see in plain text your password. So when you see, it's not the only tip that something may be going wrong, but if you're connected to some oddball network and you, your, your web browsers are popping up messages about certificate warnings, take that extremely seriously. Which brings us to website security. I believe website security is extremely important because we have a responsibility to our visitors and to our users. When we talk about website security, we think about three aspects of motivation. We think about defacement. You think about your church website with something else on the main page. There's lots of interesting pictures that you may not want to see that could be posted on the main page of your church site. We think about theft. They may not do anything to your site. They may just sit there in the background stealing information. And we think about malware spreading. We often see this. The website will appear to load fine. However, they've added a little bit to the code of the site, and it's distributing malware. Um, one thing, if you run a website, and I'm giving everybody in the world a hard time about this right now because I see it a lot. OK, quiz, what's wrong with this site? Techie people, anybody? What's wrong with this site? It's clearly shown on the screen. Uh, why am I having a problem with this website? It is not secure. How is it not secure? I have a login and a password. It's not using HTTPS. Our church runs in many places on the backs of the volunteers, but sometimes the volunteers are not technically competent enough to put HTTPS on the sites. Sometimes the church employees are not um, doing it either. I've seen it in both cases. We need to have HTTPS on our login pages. And we need to use a legitimate, proper certificate for the domain. Remember a few slides ago how I said you know, if you're seeing HTTPS warnings because you're hooked to some oddball network, you should take those seriously. If you use a certificate that you generate for free and you put it onto the site, 
your, visit, your users are going to be getting those warnings when they try and log in. And we don't want to be in the position of training people to click through the HTTPS warnings. It's destructive to train our people that. Spend the $40 to get the proper certificate for your site. As a bonus, if you are putting HTTPS on your site and you're a techie kind of a person, after you've got the HTTPS on here, visit this SSLlabs.com website and test your site with this. It will give you some technical advice for how to make your, uh, your site uh, and your certificate better. Let's talk about other issues very briefly. Here we have a, a, a fairly typical stack. Stack could be a little bit different on Windows. Maybe you have a different content management system on top. Um, if you are running a site, okay, many of you in here are communication professionals and you don't deal with those details, right? You, as long as your site's up and running, you're happy, okay? which is a good thing. I mean, you have people who do these things for you. I hope that you will go back and you will have a conversation about maintenance with the people who do your sites. Because at each level, this site can be hacked if it is not kept up to date. You can have it hacked at the WordPress level. You can have it hacked at the PHP level. Maybe not at the database level if it's been done real well. Maybe so. It can be hacked at the web server level or, oh horrors, you don't keep your operating system up to date and it's hacked all the way down to the operating system level. Have that conversation with yourself if you're doing the website or with the person who's doing it for you. How are the updates done on your site? Because often, our church has a huge history in publishing things, right? We make books, we print the books, and we give the books out, and then we just keep giving the books out and printing more if we need more and it's really popular. You can't do that with sites, people. You have to have a maintenance plan. If you don't have a maintenance plan, a way that the updates are rolling onto your site, you are just begging for trouble because that site is likely going to be hacked because it is not being kept up to date. Have a maintenance plan. If you gotta do it yourself, which a lot of us wear a lot of different hats, um, you need to subscribe to some lists that tell you when there are vulnerabilities coming through for the stack that you have, and you need to make sure those, um, those updates are rolling out. If you're really a non-techie kind of person, here are some things that you look for when you're reading through those, uh, reading through those updates. If you see words like arbitrary code and execution, that's bad news. That means somebody's gonna basically do whatever they please. SQL injection, uh, that means that somebody's doing tr something tricky with your database and maybe getting more information out of there uh, than you'd like them to. OS command injection, somebody's poked all the way down and is doing something interesting with your system software that's running. Password storage, we're about out of time and so I will uh, respect the end. Password storage, if you're making websites, especially if you are making custom application software, I hope that you have thought about the issue of how you are storing in your database those passwords. Some developers are sloppy. Some developers put those passwords in the database in plain text, which just begs for trouble when the, when the website is hacked. Uh, it should be hashed, it should be salted. If you don't know what you're doing, you better look online for some help. Um, increasingly, I really like to see when we're building uh, our sites that we have a lockout. If somebody's tried too many times and they keep getting it wrong, it makes it much harder for somebody who's trying to attack a site to keep guessing and guessing and guessing. We don't want to give somebody unlimited tries. And a two-factor option is very good as well. Two-factor means that in order to log in for the first time from a web browser, you will need your phone as well, where you get like a text code onto your phone. And you use that in combination with your password to get in. Or maybe there's an app running on your phone. You're out of time. I am not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. Okay. Two more minutes. The logo. Everybody knows about the logo. The only people authorized to use this logo are. If I am a member, can I just use it on my? No. How about water bottles? If I'm a member. For an official church. Can I print hats and sell them? 
Okay, we see a lot of stuff going on John, with the logo. So we've just we've just received as pastors umbrellas with exactly that from an outside source. So this is a touchy subject in our conference. Okay, I didn't know that. No, this is okay. a, this <laughs> is a touchy subject everywhere, people. The fact is, we are all Adventists, right? Okay. Some people believe that because I am an Adventist, I have the right to use the logo. This is not true. You will get a letter from the GC legal department if you think this is true. Just <laughs> like if I am somebody who drinks, okay, let's say Sprite. If I drink Sprite, right? That doesn't give me the right to use the Sprite logo on whatever I want. If I believe that's true, I will find out otherwise from some lawyers. Okay, another thing about the logo, we have two little R's in there. Um, if you're using the logo officially, Use the one with the R's in it. It's a registered trademark. Domain names. Who buys the domain names for you? We don't build churches on members' property. We should not be building our websites on the domain property that is owned by our volunteers. We love our volunteers. If we're going to build a site on a domain name a volunteer has registered, let's transfer that domain into church ownership before we go building the website. We have had cases where that didn't happen. Yeah, those have been around a little bit. We've had cases where that didn't happen and the church built a website on property that was not theirs and it went away because the member left. Um, things that are becoming more of an issue, privacy policies, do you have one on your site? Um, in the US, this is becoming an issue. Uh, this one I've used once or twice. I'm not entirely confident it's good. I'm not a lawyer, look at it. Uh, it will help you. It's a, it's a form-based thing. You fill in lots of things, and it will generate a privacy for you. Copyright. Music and sermons. When you're streaming, pictures on web pages. Websites designed, made for others for you. Are you sure that your graphic designer is using an image that you have the rights to? And documentation. If you're, it would be a really good idea to have proper documentation for the pictures, for the music, everything bundled up so that when you are called, you can answer, yes, I have the rights, here's the proof. Laws are getting hard about personal information. And I don't pretend to know all the laws globally regarding the storage of personal information. I know it's getting rough here in Europe as it is in the United States. Key concepts. People need to get to know and usually give consent for the information that you're collecting about the people. Generally, they need to be able to revoke that consent at a later date if they want to. And people are now expecting that you will only use that consent for the narrow case of the original reason for which you collected that personal information. Okay? So if basically if you, you if you have some sign up form and you get your email address, you get your phone number, right? Okay, they don't want you giving that to your 50 closest friends in the office and now they're getting random email from somebody they never had any relationship with. Be especially wary about things that uh, involve children and be especially wary about people and situations that may not be happy ones online and in emails because when you're not, it makes the job for the lawyers harder when it happens. Anymore, I'm liking a proper email list service when I'm sending out to large groups of people. The biggest reason I like something like MailChimp, and I'm happy to hear MailChimp plugged earlier this morning, is that they are requiring that there be a real person that they can contact. It, it kind of makes you do things the right way. They, there needs to be a real person, and the people, when they're subscribed to it, they can unsubscribe easily for themselves later, and so it gives the people the freedom to do as they please. Any more? Yeah, I'm really worried about Facebook and the way we're using Facebook. I'm seeing pictures of kids sprayed all over Facebook pages by schools, by churches. Um, if you're doing that over here, I would worry about that a bit, and make sure your schools and your churches are backing up the pictures you're taking with consent and consent for the purpose of putting it in different places online. Thank you for attention.